rusty wheel and knew I'd take her home. I brought her to my farm in an Amish neighborhood where simple living's valued. She'd be loved and understood. I put her on a treadle stand and coaxed her wheel to turn. I felt her joy and easing with my study and concern. I cleaned her and I owed her, showed her off to all my friends, repaired the hurts of years of years, and let her sew again. Welcome back. I am excited about this next machine because this is going to be one of my new babies. Um, if you have ever watched my sewing channel, which is my main channel, it's called My Bucolic Life, um, you might know that my main sewing machine is a Meister Class 101 from 1951, I think. It's hard to tell on those machines. Um, and I've used it for decades. It was my grandmother's. Love that machine. It's a German-made machine. Fabulous machine. Um, there is a part on it that just through wear has developed a crack. And it is impossible to find parts for these machines. They are so rare to get and no, I can't find anyone parting one out. So just to keep that machine from degrading. I mean, she's beautiful. She works fine. It's just that one part that has a crack in the cast metal. Um, I just wanted to find something that could work as a similar replacement. So, since I cannot find another Meister Class 101 that, you know, is compatible, I have found a FAF 130. I have not even looked up what uh, year this thing is. She's kind of froze up right now, but I think that it's a very similar in oomph in German engineering in everything else. And, uh, you know, my husband out there on a side-by-side. -side. And so I'm really looking forward to it. So let me tip the camera down and show you my machine. Okay, so this is her. She is my FAF 130. Um, the lady that I bought her from said that she used her to make her children's clothes. Well, she was a grandmother age. I think this thing has sat for at least 30 years. I think that it was last, more than that, I think this was last used in the 1970s. And so it's very tight. You know how the old oil can turn to varnish and everything. So one thing that I need to be able to do is um, disassemble her so I can clean her out really, really well. Now this machine does have the embroidery unit on it, which is so fun and fabulous, but that could complicate things right now with a basic um, mechanical issues. So what I'm planning on doing is removing the embroidery unit and just set it aside. Work on completely restoring the machine itself and then when that is done, get the embroidery unit up to speed and then reattach it. Um, I think that that will just be the, the best way for me for right now. She does have the, hang on, it's got this, you know, mad scientist light here that wants to come off. So I'm just going to set it down here right now. I'm still, I'm still up in the air about how I like the mad scientist light, but, you know, we'll deal with that later. Okay. She does have the pleated belt down here. Let me turn that camera. Okay, so you can see it here and it's very stiff. It's very oily. And I have seen um, that when these are old and oily that it can compromise the strength of the nylon in there and possibly make them more prone to breakage. I really hope not because this would be very difficult to replace. So I'm gonna do my best just to get this back up to speed as is. Um, very cool machine. I see a serial number on here so I can probably look that up. So yeah, this is gonna be her. I've got a lot of things to 
to learn about. I have never used one of these before, so let me go ahead and get started. Okay, so trying to find a place to get started. Um, the mad scientist light wants to fall off, so I'm going to pull that off really quick and just set it down. It looks like that is attached back here um, behind where the embroidery mechanism is bolted on. So, and this is coming over here. The wiring here looks like it's in pretty decent shape, so I'm happy about that, but it is somewhat exposed and everything, so it might just need to be reconnected. I think I'm going to go ahead and pull off this belt and this motor just to get it out of the way. I do have the foot pedal um, on my table behind me that just unplugged from back here. And so I have that separate. So let me go ahead and take off the motor and belt first. The first thing I'm going to do is just loosen this screw that honestly looks loose already to try to be able to raise up this motor enough to pull off the belt. There you go. Um, I'm going to take it off all the way so I can... Okay. So the motor is off. And look, these wires are pretty exposed right here. I'm sure the connection is good, but I usually don't like that much exposed. So I'll work on that. This looks... This is a different color than the foot pedal wire. This looks like someone has replaced it at one point and it looks pliable. So I'm going to be just reusing this wire. I don't see a problem with changing that. Uh, let me go ahead and see about disconnecting it. Um, I am going to make a note of how all of these are connected. It looks kind of like a singer where there is uh, one, two, and three. And since all of these wires look very similar, I'm just going to make myself a little diagram on how it's all connected. Okay, so when I was taking this apart and making my little diagram, um, there's a couple things that are a little bit concerning to me, so I probably will be pulling this motor open and taking a look and seeing what I need to redo. But this grommet here is completely broken off, and I don't want metal up against that wire. And um, there just seems to be a little bit of inconsistencies on groove to smooth to which terminal and the way that these were connected. Kind of is troubling on the outside, so it makes me wonder how they're connected on the inside. So with all of that being said, I'm going to keep all of this together, but I will probably be reworking that motor. But I've never seen this little emblem back here, so I just thought I would show that to you. Kaiser Slautern, I guess is how you pronounce that. Okay, so now I'm opening up the embroidery unit and I should be able to feed the wire for the lamp out of here. Um, and set it aside. Okay, so I've never used one of these embroidery pieces before and it looks to me, there's a little knob here, I don't know if you can even see it. It's It doesn't seem to be engaged at all, and it looks like it's supposed to direct this piece back here, which is going to tell it what cogs to engage back here, if I'm looking at it right. Now, everything is kind of stuck, and everything is dirty, dirty. So I'm just trying to figure out a way to disassemble at this point. So since this is really not physically attached to this back piece here. I don't even know if you can see. Okay, so here underneath, what I'm trying to say is this piece here is not physically attached to the front. This is that part that I'm telling you about. So this can move back and forth as it wants to. Well, it did from the front, hang on. Here, okay. see it better that way. So it can move back and forth. It's not physically attached. So what I'm thinking is that there is a bolt right up here that looks like it can come out very easily. It's actually partly loose right now. 
and inside here there's a couple main screws. I'm just going to try to use common sense, take out the things that look like it's bolting the whole mechanism. I don't want to take this apart, I just want to try to pull it off as one unit. So I pulled out this main bolt right here, and, well, let me back up the camera a hair here. So I don't know if you can tell, but it rocks now. So what that tells me is there's only one more screw holding it on, and the pivot point seems to be right here. So I'm gonna take this screw off and see if that'll pull out my unit. Okay, here it is. So that did pull it out. This little post that's sticking out here was somehow engaged with this cleated area. So I'll have to figure that out before I put it back. It's very filthy, um, but one thing I'm noticing is that there is not a plate on here just to close it off. So if I was ever wanting to use this without the unit, I'll have to come up with some kind of a replacement plate or find one that I can put on the back there. But that is what it's looking like right now. Pretty dirty, um, but that's just for starters. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and take off this little thread holder up here is very interesting. Does this one unthread? No, it wants to stay, so we will let that one stay. I'm going to go ahead and take off the balance wheel, just, you know, taking off the little locking screw here. Should be able to unscrew here. Caught my washer, very important. And it looks like there are some little, okay, the point, the side that the little tabs are pointing out, okay, so there's these two little tabs, they're pointing outwards, that goes towards the nut that I just took off. All right, so I can pull this off. The little bobbin winder tire is toast, so I'm just going to throw that away, but the Regular belt looks good, so we're going to save that. This is plastic. This is like a rubbery plastic, which is interesting. And up on top here, there's a screw, and I'm assuming that screw is going to pull off my whole little bobbin winder mechanism. And as always, what I do is I put each little component into their own little bagging into a plastic bin just to keep everything separate and yet together so that I can, you know, use everything back in its components. So we're getting closer. I'm going to go ahead and pull off the screws so I can see what is inside the nose plate. Okay. Well, it looks complete, but very, very dirty, oily, dusty, varnishy. So it, it runs, ex it turns very hard, it turns extremely stiffly. And my, ooh, there's thread wrapped around there, that's interesting. Huh, okay, well that thread wrap could cause some of the binding on it. Um, but my gut tells me that the machine is complete, it just needs a really, really good deep clean. I'm gonna take off all this little stuff down here. I got my oppressor foot, and it's nut, and I'm gonna take off a little clamp for the needle and uh, well I just loosened it it looks like I can't take it off completely until I get that screw off which I can't remove until I get the needle bar out so but at least the needle is out so it won't be stabbing me now I need to get the tension mechanism off and to me it looks like there's a screw here and a screw here and I'm hoping if I pull those out the whole thing will come out as one unit. Never done that before so let me give it a try. Okay so I just pulled those screws out and I was right the entire thing comes out as a single unit. So I'm going to put it away and it's bagging just like this so that when it comes time to clean it I can pay very close attention to how it comes apart clean it and then put it back together all at one time. I pulled off these two screws and I am taking off the bottom plates. To pull out this plate there's a little blade and it's got these tiny screws and it does not pull off easily that way and like a singer usually you push it forward it cannot do that so I'm just going to unscrew these little screws pull the blade off so I don't bend it out of shape and take it off that way. While I'm underneath I pulled out the bobbin case um, which looks kind of dirty, and there's a bobbin in it, which looks very shiny, so that's a nice thing. Um, 
I'm going to go ahead and put this aside. I'm still debating how much I'm going to be tearing down underneath here and how much I'm just going to be cleaning in place. Okay, I'm going to get started uh, working on the presser bar here. Just unscrewing at the top. Make sure I don't lose anything. All right, let me push the spring up, and there is a washer on top of the spring. That comes up, and now I'm going to uh, take off this screw here, which is attached to the block, so that hopefully I can pull the presser bar out. Okay. So I don't want to lose that. This is kind of stuck on with goo, so I'm just going to try to put some uh, something on there to loosen it up. Okay, so I have let this sit for a little bit with some penetrating oil and gunk remover and stuff on it. Um, I'm going to go ahead and take off this screw, which should pull off this bracket, and also this screw, which should release my uh, presser foot lifter. And once all this is gone, if I need to tap on here, I can. Okay, so here is the lifter with its very long pin. So I'm going to put that away. This I had to give one more little spritz because that is kind of tight. I may have to heat it to get this little screw here loose. Okay, a little heat, a little oil did the trick. So I'm just going to pull this out. There's a spring behind here. Oh, that I want to make sure I don't lose a little spring like that. The small end gets on this little nub that's at the back of it, like that. So let me put this in its little baggie and start working on this piece. Okay, so this is finally loose so I can pull my presser bar out. And then this block, you can see this big old piece off the back, it goes up and down in a slot back here. Now that that presser bar is off, I'm going to go ahead and take off this screw right here real quick that is holding on the thread guide, and I can take this clamp off and just be done with it. While I am removing little things, I'm going to go ahead and take off this little bracket here with the little disc that is used for lining up the thread for the bobbin winder. I'm just going to pop that off real quick. I'm going to go ahead and remove the little stitch length knob and there's a little pointer underneath it. It looks like this little shiny piece is riveted on. There's no screws here. So if I'm going to paint it, I'm going to need to just mask over that. I'm not going to try to pry it off or anything. Okay, I'm going to spend some time trying to take off my little stitch regulator and I just sprayed a whole bunch of penetrating oil in there. And so now it's moving way freely, which is nice. And on the side here, there's a little screw. So I have loosened that up. I'm going to loosen it a little bit more because I'm going to try to get it so I can pull this whole thing off like so. So there it is. Okay. So I'm just going to leave this all together and uh, see what I can do about this down here. Okay, so if you push this little thumb, thumb pusher down, you can see that it moves the shaft back and forth to different selectors. Okay, I'm going to take off these two screws and hopefully that will pull the whole plate off. Okay, so that lifted this whole part off, which is going to go in the bag with the first part. And then this is just the cast metal. Um, This piece is attached to the shaft below this level, so I'm going to think about that for a while and decide what I'm going to do. Underneath it, there's this little mechanism here, and there's a spring inside the hole. That's what this pushes down onto. Uh, I need to get that spring out so I don't lose it. So let me get my little dental tool see if it will lift and it does okay so this little spring and this little thing that looks kind of like a rivet goes into this little screw i don't even know if you can see that right here 
Okay, I'm going to work down here, and there's two screws here. I'm going to try to remove my feed dog plate. Okay, so that comes off just like this. And now the whole little bobbin race area is exposed. I just noticed there is a bar that comes straight through here where the tension mechanism was, and that goes with the tension. I just forgot to put, pull it out and put it in the bag. So I'm gonna go ahead and just get this bar that just slides through a hole over there and put it in with the tension. I'm still having an eternal debate on how far I'm tearing down this and the needle bar because I am not sure, I've never done one of these before and I know nothing about setting the timing on them. I'm sure there's a YouTube video on that if I needed. Um, but I might try to just leave the needle bar as is and this in place and clean. But I am finding all kinds of places where thread is just, you know, layer after layer of thread is wrapped around things and kind of glued into place. So that's probably not helping how it's all very, very tight. So I'm just going to spend a few minutes and pull off. This is like the fourth layer of thread that's been around this little uh, bobbin race here. I've decided I'm going to go ahead and try to pull. This looks like this is a cover that separates, and this looks like the kind of place where there would be some gears interlocking. So I'm going to try to open this and just see what's in there and if there's some, you know, old grease or something that I need to pull out and replace. Well, I did find gears. They, there is no grease in there. It is dry, dry. So I'm going to do a little research and find out if I'm supposed to put some grease in. Um, but it looks like they're clean, so that's a plus. I just pulled this out from around the little groove right here in the race. It's stuff like this, along with all the grease that I think is bogging this machine down. Okay, I've made the executive decision that I'm pretty much going to leave it as is and soak it in a bucket of kerosene and try to just let it clean all the gunk out from all of these places. I don't feel confident in my ability to get this timed perfectly. And right now I'm assuming that it is timed correctly, you know. If, it, if I get it put back together and it's not timed, well then I will cross that hurdle at that point. But um, I think that I have it opened up enough and cleaned out enough that I can pretty much just soak it clean it with whatever pieces are in place very well and then I am going to be painting this but instead of just totally stripping it I'm going to give it a light sanding to rough it up a little bit and primer it before I sand before I give it its color. Um, there is a little knob here that's a little plastic knob that I need to get off. This is what regulates uh, being able to drop the feed dogs so I'm just going to take this off and put it separate. One thing I noticed also is that there are some plastic gears in there. I thought this was an all metal machine, but you know, between the plastic balance wheel, a couple plastic knobs, and there is a, you can't even see it, but back behind this square here, there's a plastic gear in there too. So it's more nylon than plastic, I should say, at least from the looks of it. Uh, but pulling all these pieces off and oiling it as I go, she is freeing up a lot more, so I'm, I'm very hopeful. Actually, there's one more piece I'm going to take off um, over here where I took that knob off the top. When I paint it, I'm going to want that post off, so I am just going to take off this little screw here, which is holding it on, and... Uh, then just leave this bar hanging out here so I can move the post down. So if I take this screw, it's got a little washer behind it. All right, moving this bar, I should be able to pull this whole little post out. Come on, very sticky. go. So that whole little post is out. There is a little um, washer that fell down, so I'm assuming that was on here. 
and uh, I'm going to put this aside. This can just hang out as is. I'll put this back on after painting. And that leaves this completely flat, so that'll be easier to deal with than working around something. Okay, so I have the machine over in a big plastic tote with kerosene. Um, the bucket I was going to use was too small for that machine. So I'm going to let that soak probably overnight. I'm just going to take some time and start cleaning up some little pieces, just slowly taking them apart piece by piece and uh, cleaning them up and putting them back together. Um, I am still deciding how the finished product on this machine is going to look, so there's a lot of pieces that are black that are like this one and things. So I'm thinking whatever I do, it's gonna be something with black accents. And that way, um, I'm gonna be able to leave these pieces their original color. So I will let you know what that's going to be. But right now, I'm just gonna get started cleaning everything off. Hello, everybody. So you'll have to forgive me because this video is gonna be very different from my other ones. I'm not taking you step by step through it. Um, when I got to the phase where I was going to go to my next step, you know, where we all last left off, Mark, my husband, was in here. It was very, very noisy. And I just was honestly in the mood to just blast through and work on things without filming. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's very different when you're trying to film and document every single step. And some days you just don't feel like it. So I also wanted to try some very new techniques on this. And I did not know how it was going to work. So I didn't want to film it and then film myself going, oh crap, you know, but it worked out. So before I turn the camera down and show you what she looks like now, because she has been painted and put back together and everything at this phase, um, a couple things. First of all, she's crazy fast. I mean, crazy fast. I, I have her motor off right now because I rewired it differently and I'll explain that later. Um, but I had it on, hooked up, and she is as fast. I had an industrial machine probably about 15 years ago. She's as fast as that machine. Crazy fast. I don't know if it's the motor or the foot pedal or both or I don't know but just saying first wow fastest machine I own um, so what I did is well let me just tip the camera down and show you what she looks like first now I fully expect some will love it and some will hate it and that is just fine um, she called out to me and said that she wanted to be extravagant, and so that is what she is. Move that out of the way. So let me explain how I painted her. Um, once I had her totally clean, what I did is I knew that I was keeping her components, the original black, okay? All of the embroidery unit and things like that. So it would be something that goes with black. And um, she wanted to be something between an 80s tuxedo for the prom with sequins and a lowrider and something else. I don't know. But I love her. First, I painted, gave her a coat of um, electric blue. Just a plain electric blue paint. All right. Then I put on all of her crazy flowers. Okay, what those are, are temporary tattoos. Okay, I take it back. What I did is I gave her a coat of this, Brilliant Blue, first, okay? Once the Brilliant Blue was on, she got two coats of this. This is that fun color shifting paint, all right? Where at a certain angle, it looks a little purple, at another angle, it looks kind of blue. At another angle, it looks kind of turquoise. It's just really cool paint. And usually you're supposed to put it over black. You know, it says paint over black. 
And I've done that before, but I wanted to paint over blue. So this is what happens, and it's kind of fun. Once she had a couple coats of that on, then I put her tattoos on. And I just got a couple packs of this stuff, um, you know, just Walmart or Amazon or whatever. And the difference between a water slide decal and a tattoo is that these stick from the top. Water slide decals stick from the bottom. So when you're applying these, you put it face, peel off the plastic, put it face down, get the whole thing wet, and then peel off the paper from this way. Water slide decals, it's the opposite. You get it wet and you slide the paper backing out from underneath, okay? But that's what she had on here. So I had never, I had heard about it, but I never tried it. So that was one of my experiments. I think it's kind of fun. So then after that was dry, then I came back and gave her another coat on top of her um, tattoos of this again. Because I didn't want them to be really stark. I wanted it to be kind of in the background. So I don't know if you can tell, it is a little bit glittery on top of all of the flowers. Okay. Then, once all that was done, I came back and on the base mostly, but on some of this, I just gave it a little light clear coat, just in the places that are going to get a lot of use. Um, and that is about it. I put her back together, learned a lot. There's one thing that is not functioning well on her, and it's just for the for engaging the embroidery machine. Um, for and oh, and there was a piece inside of her that was on completely upside down that I did not take out because I didn't want to mess with it. And it took me a long time to figure out how to get her to work because that piece was upside down. So there is no way she could have functioned when I purchased her. So she does work now. I do need to put her motor back on. I took it off because, um, and I took her mad scientist light off too. And the reason is because she's going to become one of my daily workhorses in my sewing lab. So the way I have, because I have a lot of machines, and I love to use a lot of different machines, but you can't have that many tables around. All right, I have got her set up at my sewing table. And before I demonstrate her, I mentioned that I was going to tell you why I wire her the way I do, where I just have the one little plug. And yes, this is an extremely short wire. That's because this was the wire that came with her attached to her motor and it was in good shape so I didn't want to cut it off because I didn't need to but it was a very short wire because it only had to go a short distance so that's why it's there but the way that I have my table set up as you can see I have a light motor block here that is attached to a foot pedal that I love so much at the bottom I have been using this same foot pedal for probably 25 years it's great um, and I can tell you that when I was in my workshop trying her out and she was going insanely crazy fast, I think the problem was with the foot pedal that came with her. And I had cleaned it out. I had tested what I thought you could test to make sure that she worked well. But it, the foot pedal was just too much juice. When I plugged her into my foot pedal that I know and love and has always been very faithful, she ran very controlled and I'm very happy with that. But I know that the motor has the oomph to put out a lot of juice, but I don't need it. So anyhow, I did not put her mad scientist light back on her because to me it's kind of clumsy having all of that out here. So as you can see, I have a big overhead light over my main electric sewing table. And then I have a couple of these guys handy. So if I ever have a machine that does not have a light, I just pop that on. It's battery operated and I can turn it on and voila, she has a light. And then when I'm done with it, I can just turn it off and pop it back over onto my stand. and It'll be ready for the next time. And the reason that I do things this way is because I have a lot of machines that I love. So these are some new cabinets I have, but my method is 
that I want to be able to use my machines and unfortunately having a lot of sewing machine cabinets is not very handy. I have one in here still. I have this girl over here which is where my 201 is hiding but you know that little table makes me happy so she's going to stay put for right now. But what I have is I have my electrical machines that in general like my Meister over there let me come over here. My Meister is my main machine that I have been using forever. It does have a part right here that is broken and it's impossible to source a replacement part for her. I've tried. Believe me, I've tried. So just because of that, I don't want to overwork her, which is why I got the FAF 130, which is the closest to a compatible uh, German machine that I can get to to this Meister. But all I have to do then if I want to use her is just lift her with her little base up and set her onto my table, plug her into the motor block and I'm ready to go. Okay. Now I also have a lot of treadles that I like to use. So I have my universal treadle cabinet and it's the same thing. I have a battery operated light that I can pop onto them as you can see. But that way, if I want to use a different treadle, swooping over again, all I have to do is grab one off my top rack here, put it on, and I'm ready to go. So with all of that explanation as to why I set my, my machines up the way I do, uh, let's go ahead and see how the FAF 130 runs. Now just the caveat, I am not using the embroidery system, coffee grinder, whatever you want to call that back there. I don't have that activated right now. Um, I will do some fine tuning. There's a linkage I have to connect, I think, to the, the belt over here. But anyway, I have that to do later. Right now, I'm just going to show how she runs with her straight stitch and zigzag. Mm -hmm. This is a shorter stitch length here. I'm going to bump it up to a longer stitch length. Let's go to the longest there is. Why not? Okay. So you can hear her. She's doing great. Her tension is great. For the zigzag, what I need to do is adjust this. This is her width. I'm going to make it the widest that there is here. And so right now I have her set at the widest zigzag width with the widest stitch length. Okay, she's doing great. That's how she sounds. Um, I will be, like I said, getting the fine tuning on her embroidery unit, but the main thing that I wanted for her in this machine she's going to stay with me is to have a backup workhorse. My Meister has been my workhorse for decades. This is going to be my, my backup workhorse so that they can be friends over there and speak German to each other or whatever it is that they're going to do in the night. And um, this is, machine is heavy duty enough that I can use it for, you know, all kinds of thicker thicker weight projects than I would run through than say my little new home new home treadle which I love uh, but she's a much more lightweight whereas this let me crank her down here this can do all kinds of things decorative things um, down to a satin stitch monogramming I'm just moving her around here She can do all kinds of fun things, you know. I'm really going to enjoy her. So I just wanted to share that with you. Hope you liked it, and I will see you next time. I found an antique sewing machine, forgotten and alone. I touched her rusty wheel and knew I'd take her home. I brought her to my farm in an Amish neighborhood. Where simple living's valued, she'd be loved and understood. 
I put her on a treadle stand and coaxed her wheel to turn. I felt her joy and easing with my study and concern. I cleaned her and I owed her, showed her off to all my friends, repaired the hurts of years of yours, and left her so again.